special guest, Sunit from Sebastian Fitness Solutions. And uh, today we're going to be talking about IIFYM, if it fits your macros, versus clean eating. So basically, I want to make sure that uh, we're clearing up some misconceptions about uh, IIFYM, um, or otherwise known as flexible dieting. And we're going to look at, is there really any credibility to that whole concept of eating clean or meal timing, food choices, etc. when it comes to uh, physique transformation. But uh, before we get into that, Sunit, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, can you please uh, just give the viewers a little of an introduction about yourself? Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me over. It's, really, it's a real pleasure. So my name is Sunit Sebastian, as uh, Josh has mentioned, and um, I my story starts off with me being this you know geeky little kid back in high school who was bullied by just about everyone and then you know a little pudgy on the uh, a little on the fat side so then as i finished high school i start you know getting this sudden interest in um, you know transforming my physique and getting in shape so and i was really dedicated so the first thing that uh, that uh, i thought of doing was you know what just let me just cut out all food entirely let me stop eating <laughs> and i just end up eating just salads and soup for the entire day and playing like three hours of basketball almost every day. Oh no. And the end result is I went from like 75 kgs of uh, blubber down to less than 60 kilograms and I look like an anorexic little girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the funny thing is that, uh, you know, I could see a set of six pack in, in the mirror and I, this little lemon sized bicep and I was like very impressed by that and thought that I was in great shape. Little did I, it, it took me a little time to realize that I, I uh, in the end I was just like a skinny little twig. So mm -hmm. finally, I end up uh, in the gym, uh, like just about everybody else, looking to build some muscle, uh, you know, get some size on those uh, scrawny little arms. And one thing I realized is that a lot of, there was very little information that's out there, and uh, any good good information. And I was just stranded in the gym, and I would just do endless number of sets of bicep curls and tricep extensions. And uh, I would just yeah, there's old. there's plenty of information, but there's lots of misinformation. Yeah, yeah, there is, yes, there's a, yeah, but there's not enough proper guidance. <laughs> so. Fortunately, within a month into uh, my training, I came across a seminar by a man who later on became my mentor. And the funny thing is that his seminar was on fat loss and the basic uh, misconceptions about fat loss. And what resonated with me was that every single thing that he said, every point that he made, every mistake that somebody else makes, I did that. And I, he explained scientifically why that's a problem. And it really resonated with me because I was amazed as to, because whatever I did, it took a lot of effort and a lot of hard work a lot of dedication, but I realized that all of my hard work and dedication was put in the wrong direction, the wrong place. And if I had just known the science, and if I had just known what to do when, then I would have been in a much better position than I was back then. So that led me to, to realize the importance of science and understanding the, the, uh, the, understanding the facts behind training, or behind nutrition, and that is what led me to my uh, pursuit of it. And, and while studying for engineering in college, I was also simultaneously studying the various sciences in fitness like kinesiology and exercise science and sports nutrition. And that's when finally, you know, I used that to transform myself from that skinny, strong little fellow that I'm sure you can go to my site and you'll find that pic. <coughs> yeah, I've seen and it, yeah. That, you've seen it, right? So I, I don't believe that's you. That. No, I just can't. <laughs> yeah, that, that was me. And funny yeah. thing is I was actually skinnier than that at one point. Oh, wow. <laughs> believe it or not. But yeah, from there to around 185 pounds and maintain my six pack throughout the journey and it took a while a couple of years because it was completely drug free and it was a learning process throughout the entire time but that's how I got there and finally using that information and collecting all that information I came to a realization that this is something that I want to do I want to do what that mentor my mentor did for me and basically spread the knowledge of science out there to every eager fitness enthusiast who's ended up in the gym looking to transform himself and doesn't know where to go and doesn't know which person to rely on and what kind of information to rely on. And there's a lot of clutter that's out there. So that's my story. <laughs> Excellent. Now, I'm sure that, that your experience of uh, you know, wanting to transform yourself when you're in your teens, not feeling good about your body, a lot of uh, young people can identify with that, I'm sure. Well, I'm glad you're here to, uh, to share some information with us today, too, and, and uh, spread your, your knowledge to my viewers as well. Um, and uh, without further ado, let's get into the, the topic of, uh, of uh, IIFYM. Um, I just posted a short little video chatting about this on, on my uh, YouTube channel recently, um, and we got a new discussion about it, and uh, I, you have a, a wealth of information, or I, I really liked your perspective on this anyway, so uh, I'm glad you're here to, to, to talk about that with us today. Uh, so 
Uh, what would you, um, how would you introduce that topic, or what would be the first thing that you'd want to sort of make clear to people when they're talking about flexible dieting? Or uh, I guess most people don't even look at it as that. They don't realize that uh, IIFYM was sort of evolved from this uh, idea of flexible dieting. Yeah, well, the thing is that there's been a lot of debate recently and a lot of, you know, there's the war of words between these two clans of people, one that support quote-unquote clean eating and the other that's uh, usually the, the guys who follow science and guys who follow research and who have realized that uh, if it fits your macros or flexible dieting rather has a lot of backup to it. A lot of people who are successful are also following it. So then uh, it's kind of like attacking the idea, that the very long-held idea that you need to suck, suffer and eat these bland foods all the time to get in shape. So that's what, it's, at the end of the day, it's like a war that's going on between two factions. Uh, and, and what's happening is that uh, as in any war or any kind of fight, there's a lot of miscommunication and uh, an exchange of many ideas which are not really true. So... In the, at the end of the day, the, the perspective is not very clear on it, and a lot of times uh, the actual facts are not being put out there. So the first and foremost critique, or rather the main, if you look at it, uh, the guys who follow clean eating or, you know, who, who just who, who make sure that not a single gram of whatever they eat comes from any quote-unquote junk food, their basic critique about if it fits your macros is that it allows you to eat any junk whatsoever as long as it fits your macros which is partially a, a fault of them for not doing enough research and partially a fault of the name itself. Whereas the name, if it fits your macros, is so misleading from the actual concept. The truth is that the concept of IIFYM, basically uh, the actual concept of it, or the people who actually promote it, say that the actual idea behind it is that as long as you're getting quality nutrients, as long as you're getting your micronutrients in, you're getting the amount of fiber you need, you're getting the amount of quality protein you need and the essential fats, then you can get a certain portion of your calories, again, a certain portion, from uh, quote-unquote junk foods. So that's the idea behind IIFYM. But the name doesn't suggest that at all. The name just makes it sound like they're just they're running after macros. That's it. <clears throat> so that's partially a fault of the name itself, which is the reason why the term flexible dieting is far more appropriate to describe it than IIFYM. But uh, so at the end of the day, this is the problem. The problem is that there's a lot of miscommunication. So I'd like to go into that primarily. Excellent. No, that's great. Um, and I think part of the problem is also the people, some proponents of IIFYM or who have sort of adopted it because it be, it's become trendy also may not understand what they're talking about when they're describing, you know, if it fits your macros as well. So it's Absolutely. the people that are, you know, uh, the, the bro scientists, so to speak, that, who are proposing, you know, clean eating is the, is the only way to, to go, um, are having arguments with people who are in favor of if it fits your macros, but also don't understand it and, and do believe that it, all it means is, uh, you know, we can get all of our carbohydrates from Pop-Tarts if we want to and, you know, all of our fats can be from, you know, quote-unquote crap sources uh, of nutrition. But, you know, that's important, I think, to, to, to realize that uh, the flexible dieting is saying that we have an allotted calorie intake that we want to get in and we want to make sure we're meeting certain nutritional requirements for our protein, fats, carbs, micronutrients, fiber, within that calorie intake. Once we've met those minimal requirements and we have, we still have some calories to make up, what's the problem with having some, you know, I guess what some people call treats or junk food. They're saying it's not, it's not junk. If we've met our nutritional requirements, enjoy some of that stuff along the way. And, and, and if you look at it clearly, if you look at it prop, yeah, from, from a uh, from certain perspective, you'll see that <laughs> IFYM of flexible dieting is probably 80% or 85%, maybe even 90% clean eating itself. And then a little bit of 5% 5 or 10% extra, maybe a little bit more. But if you look, if you are going to actually follow the premise of uh, flexible dieting, you will end up having 85% of your diet as clean eat, quote unquote clean eating there itself. The problem is that when people find the concept that they can latch on to, uh, a lot of people, you know, there are certain people who defend certain diets a lot because it works for them or, or it, they have seen exceptional results or any kind of concept that really uh, sticks with what they want. You know, sometimes you have these uh, certain beliefs of your own and certain outcomes that you want yourself. So say if, if you've been somebody who's all, never been able to restrain from having a certain kind of food and then you come across a concept of somebody coming and telling you that, oh, you know what, it's okay to eat uh, junk food, so, then you... <coughs> psychologically try to gravitate to that and then these people are the ones who end up claiming that or end up misapplying the concept of IFYM and then uh, taking it and saying that you know what it doesn't matter what I eat 
uh, as long as this way. But as any person who's properly understood IFY, I mean, actually practices and preaches it, has clearly stated that it's it's maybe most of it is actually clean eating with a little bit of uh, something on the side, and not really what people uh, you know think of of what it is. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, the the junk food portions make better Instagram and Facebook pictures. So that's what everyone <laughs> sees. You know, they're they post post pictures of uh, you know bacon and pop tarts and uh, you know chocolate bars with you know hashtag I I F Y M. So it's it's been associated as a junk food diet when that's a complete yeah. misrepresentation. Exactly, and this is this is again. I would still say it's a it's a partially the fault of a person who understands the concept. Because what happens is that when you're when you're famous for touting a certain concept and being uh, different or or st sticking out, you tend to highlight that over other things that you you know. Like if if a guy who's known for propagating IFIM and who's who's standing behind it, he's he's probably going to show him practicing or eating uh, junk rather than he, uh, show himself eating the rest of his meals, right? So uh, what yeah. happens is that it's not, it's not wrong. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but the problem is that, that you know he's trying to show basically. But the problem is that somebody who's following him will look at that and say, well, you know what, um, Mr. X Y Z, who's who's in great shape or who who basically lives and breeds a uh, flexible dieting, is <coughs> he's having this certain meal. So maybe I can have the same whenever I want, no matter what my you know. And, and mm -hmm. that's what happens is that people misapply. Uh, certain advice or certain you know practices that uh, that are uh, performed by other people. So it, at the end of the day, it's, uh, I would not say it's a problem with the concept itself, but rather the the way people interpret it and the way the message is sent across. Absolutely. So uh, let's get into that a little deeper now. Um, yeah. The proponents of clean eating uh, will argue that uh, meal timing and uh, food choices. Um, the type of carbohydrate, like low glycemic carbohydrate versus high glycemic, um, all have an effect on body composition. Whereas many proponents of uh, of flexible dieting will typically downplay that to a certain extent. At least from my conversations with people that are, you know, uh, hardcore if it fits your macros guys, um, will argue that. It does not matter when you eat, what you eat. You could eat it all in one meal a day, get all of your, hit all your macronutrients uh, requirements, your caloric requirements, and that's fine. You could eat it at midnight. Uh, you, you know that. And there's definitely, a, I've, I've tried out uh, intermittent fasting for a while as, and as well, and it, and it, it does sort of um, make sense that eating every three hours is a little bit, you know, strict regimented, and it not, might not be. It, it, it necessary. There might be advantages as far as blood sugar and whatnot, but it doesn't speed up your metabolism. It does. So there's a lot of misconceptions around that. So let's get into um, uh, food choices, uh, like uh, low GI carbs versus uh, you know high GI carbs, and meal timing. There's two specific things which I think a lot of people sort of uh, hype on. Now, is that uh, a load of crap? Is, is meal timing all baloney and like uh, a fairy tale? Uh, and like, does it matter what kind of carbs you get as long as you're hitting your your nutrient ratios for carbohydrate? What what's your view on that? Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's a very very good point because the the I think the biggest critique that uh, or any any kind the first point that uh, the clean eating guys put forth when it comes to any debate with with uh, if it fits your macros is usually the oh, the effect on insulin and uh, high GI carbs and low GI carbs. Well. When it comes to that specifically, it's pretty clear that the glycemic index system itself is majorly flawed uh, because when you measure the glycemic index of a certain food, a certain carbohydrate rather, it's done just by eating purely that kind of carbohydrate which is not emulating a real life scenario when you'll, you'll be eating uh, a meal which will include carbohydrates, a certain amount of protein and fat as well. And we know that uh, including a certain amount of protein and including a certain amount of fat especially will uh, Drastically change the glycemic uh, response of a certain meal. The, the, so it, we're, the, then we get into the glycemic index. We get into talking about glycemic load then. Yeah. yeah. Versus index. Yeah. Yeah. No. Even then. Yes. Even then. But the idea is the insulin secretion would not be as uh, say if you ingest uh, 50 grams of sugar or by itself. Yes, there's going to be a stark uh, insulin uh, response. But if you're going to ingest say uh, 50 grams of sugar along with uh, you know say casein protein. And maybe a little bit, maybe some uh, nuts. It's a mixed meal, right? So mm -hmm. suddenly it's not going to have the same insulin response. 
So the, the when when it comes to the debate <laughs> as to the food, whether which foods are impo- are uh, affect a certain meal uh, and its connection with insulin, that is not not really a very strong point because it's kind of uh, proven that insulin response is going to be very dependent on the composition of your meal. And if your meal is a normal meal, a mixed meal of con- containing more than just a carbohydrate, the insulin response is not going to be um, as stark as what we would see on the glycemic index. So that point itself is uh, void. Does that not? Does that mean that meal timing or the the composition of your meals does not matter at all? Absolutely not. People tend to focus too much on the direct effect of certain thing on uh, body composition. Well, if you're Probably not. Probably eating a certain amount of food, uh, making sure that the macros are the same, are probably not going to affect your um, your body composition directly by a lot. But say, if, let me just compare. Okay, before I go into that point, that's something that I want to keep for later on. But uh, let's compare a certain food, right? Let's let's compare, uh, for example, eating uh, you know a, a normal meal, which would you're trying to get a certain amount of fat, right? So we, we try to, in one meal, in a clean meal, we try to get a certain quantity of fat from, uh, say, nuts. On the other hand, we're eating um, a cheat meal where you are getting the, probably the, the fat in there is going to be a considerable amount of saturated fat or trans fatty acids if you're eating something that's highly processed. So over there, if you're getting the same amount of uh, fat, dietary fat from, uh, say, 20 grams or 25 grams of dietary fat in one meal, in, in a clean meal from nuts, and uh, good fat sources as opposed to saturated and trans fatty acids, then uh, it's, it's pretty clear that it's not going to be the same. And uh, maybe carbohydrates not so much, but protein and fat, the quality of the nutrient does matter quite a lot. So to say that me- meal composition doesn't matter at all, I wouldn't say that's entirely true. And it would be a very, uh, I think it would be a very simplistic or a very minimalistic look at uh, you know, maybe you're just observing your immediate effect on body composition rather than the overall impact on the body itself. Right, and uh, we we got a little bit into effect on insulin of uh, of carbohydrate intake on insulin. Uh, what's your take on the argument of hormonal effect of foods? I mean, it's, I, in in my point of view, I mean that there is definitely the the food choices, the type of food you eat. As far as the ratios of fats to carbs, does have an effect on different hormones. Uh, in which cases does that is significant enough to impact your progress? In which you know, uh, in which cases is, is it sort of overplay, uh, you know, uh, exaggerated a little bit? What, what's your opinion on that? Well, I'll I'll make a very uh, honest statement saying that I my knowledge in endocrinology isn't really that strong where I can make a statement as uh, unequivocally and as confidently as I do with training, but I will say that I will probably give you guys uh, anybody who's watching just try and observe or try to think of a time when you're eating a meal, uh, or you know that that has a lot of say processed carbohydrates or you're having say if you're trying to get this is a perfect example actually, say you are uh, trying to eat a post-work, pre-workout meal, right, before you're going to go into the gym, and you want to get maybe, say, around 60 grams of carbohydrates in. So if you take that same quantity, uh, everything else being constant, making sure that the protein, you're going to be, eat it with protein, of course, but your protein source is going to be the same, but you're going to just replace uh, your, your carb source for, uh, as 50 grams of uh, sugar or 50 grams of any processed simple carb, uh, as opposed to 50 grams of uh, complex carbs through any other source. The way you feel during the workout, the way you perform during the workout, how full you feel, and also the effect on the way your mood, your performance, is going to be considerably different. Uh, let's take the example of, of the neurotransmitter serotonin. It has a consider uh, the the amount of carbohydrates you ingest, the type of carbohydrates you ingest, has a has a significant effect on your serotonin levels. And uh, serotonin is a neurotransmitter basically which makes you feel uh, feel good and sleepy, a little you know. So. <clears throat> Say you're eating a meal which is a uh, little high in carbohydrate, even though your entire daily uh, daily uh, macros are the same, you're eating a, a a meal which is slightly higher in carbohydrates as opposed to another. The effect on serotonin is going to be different, and probably it's going to affect your performance in the gym. Not for everybody, but for somebody definitely. I mean, isn't I isn't serotonin? Sorry to interrupt. Isn't serotonin the hormone that after sex it's pretty high too? 
Uh, I, I, least, uh, I I've, I've yeah, read that. I think I think, I think, I think that's I think that's all, that's that's oxytocin. I think so. Uh, okay, well, I, 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 well, people can Google that. Anyway, that's one, how I that feel after. Is, uh, I feel satisfied and sleepy after that too. So I was just thinking, <laughs> <laughs> and that's not how you want to feel. Basically, going into a workout as your point that yeah. you, you you want to be energized yeah. and you want to have a, a exactly okay. Yeah, the main the main thing that I would like to emphasize is that people tend to focus so much on uh, the immediate effect on body composition. You know, so we'll <clears throat> we'll uh, like say like just let's let's compare us to two diets that are identical in caloric intake. Uh, let's say we're, we're keeping it at maintenance, okay, and they are identical at caloric intake and macronutrient split, but the only difference is that uh, you know you're consuming, say, more clean foods in one as opposed to more uh, processed one the other so first point that i would say is that there's a lot of unpredictability in cheat foods okay so when you when you have these clean foods that you're set up it, it becomes a little easier to predict uh, the macronutrients that you're getting right because if you go out and, and order a pizza chances are you're probably not going to get to track as, uh, the calories uh, macros properly that's a one fairly okay point that you can make about it another thing is the nutrient value of foods like say if you're eating ice cream and then it leads you to intake a certain amount of uh, fat. Now, although in terms of grams of fat you may you may accommodate it within your macros, but uh, the quality of fat matters as well, right? What kind of fat it is. So if you're eating 20 grams of uh, saturated fat, uh, you know it's not the same as eating 20 grams of mono unsaturated fat in terms of quality of nutrition or the effect on your, you know, on your on the. It's not not saying that saturated fat is bad. I don't want to jump on. I'm not that kind of person. No. to jump on that bandwagon. But no. uh, it's just the difference is obviously clear. And you, you know, the the amount of fat you eat in a day is is, is considerably less compared to the amount of protein and uh, carbs you eat. And you want to make sure that every uh, every little bit of fat that you're getting in is going to well, be something. Depending on your. Yeah, that depends yeah, no, on the it, ratios yeah, you're course, ascribing to. I, I mean, I've had high, I've gone higher yeah, fat yeah. before too. But yeah, yeah, I, no, I hear no, you. that that depends. Yeah, but in most cases, I'm just saying in a general diet, in yeah. a general maintenance or, or or bulk bulking diet or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. it's pretty, pretty much going to be the same like that. Uh, and more, yeah. So then the point is that maybe uh, the uh, a different in the qual or the or the sources of your food may not affect your body composition immediately directly, but it can definitely affect uh, overall health and different aspects of your physiology such as you know your energy levels how you feel throughout the day you know because a lot of people when they have sustain a slow release carbohydrate or a, or a complex carbohydrate they tend to feel a little more satiated they tend to feel little the energy levels seem to be better blood glucose seems to be more neutral whereas if you have some and you know if you have somebody taking uh, a processed carb they, you know it's very often that you find them feeling hungry more often uh, the energy levels don't seem very good so, and this can obviously indirectly affect your performance. So, it mm -hmm. can directly affect your performance and indirectly affect your body composition. So, to look at a certain uh, dietary uh, practice and say that it's not going to make me look different directly, if you, if you also consider the indirect effects of it as well, right? Exactly. Uh, I agree. Uh, um, now, oh, first of all, I just want to get... Uh, I mean, we've talked about it before. Clean eating. Uh, that we're we're throwing around that term because that's sort of the term that's been applied by the people that practice it. Um, it, it is. It's almost as ridiculous as if it fits your macros. I mean, foods aren't really clean or dirty, right? I mean, we you you sort of said uh, whole foods are more uh, less processed foods versus processed foods. So the term clean eating, just for viewers out there, we're, we're using that term because that's sort of how people understand it. Uh, in my opinion, anyway, I mean, what what is a clean food? Like, does that mean it's been laundered? Or, but anyway, so that it is it is kind of a, a vague descriptive term, but that that that's sort of how people understand it. Um, now, I wanted to get into uh, meal timing. Does it matter? Can you eat all of your you know nutrients and calories in one meal a day and uh, on, on a, over the long term? Will that make any real difference in body composition versus uh, you know, your three meals a day, or like six times a day, like the, or does it matter what foods you eat at what times of day? Will that make any significant change in your body composition? Okay, first, first point right off the bat. Theoretically, maybe it could, it could be possible. Again, I would like to see a, a little more research on this because I, I'm yet to think, yet to believe that theoretically eating at one meal, uh, come, come, you know, I don't think it's practically possible. First of all. And even if it was, I don't think uh, 
from the practical standpoint, uh, it would affect uh, overall the way you feel, the, the way that your day goes, probably affect your performance in the gym. Uh, you know, so it, theoretically maybe, but practically definitely not. Mm-hmm. And uh, talking about the importance of meal timing, uh, let me give an example. And this is an example I like to refer to. Let's talk about the metabolism of fructose. Now, before anybody, now I know a lot of IFIM guys and a certain person that they follow, uh, you know, I've been speaking a lot against fructose and I'm not speaking against fructose. Neither am I talking on the same lines as uh, Dr. Lustig. So uh, don't don't start bashing me right off the bat. <laughs> but uh, just taking the example of fructose metabolism, usually when you ingest certain carbohydrate in, uh, the body stores it first in uh, liver glycogen certain amount of glucose that flows in the bloodstream is utilized for immediate activity, of course, but then the remaining first the storing process starts with storing in the liver glycogen, followed by which it goes in the muscle glycogen, which is a considerably larger storage space. And then finally, whatever's left in, uh, in balance is stored in fat stores. It's the same as equating maybe, say, storing cash at you know in your pockets, which I have a very limited amount you can carry. Then if you want to store cash somewhere else, you can store it in a, in a, in a locker in your home. Which is going to have a lot more space than your in your pockets do, and then finally any extra cash that you have, you can store in the bank, and that's an unlimited uh, storage space. So it's pretty much the same way. With fructose, on the other hand, fructose metabolism occurs entirely in the liver, right? So when you ingest a certain amount of fructose, it gets metabolized in the liver, and it has to be stored in the liver as liver glycogen. If the liver glycogen is full the metabolism of fructose does not allow it to be stored into muscle glycogen. So immediately, it's if the, if the liver glycogen is full, the next play, the ne- next outcome that's going to happen is that whatever's remaining is going to be converted into triglyceride and stored as fat. So if you just take that example itself, if you're eating fructose, I'm obviously, you know, you're not going to eat, people don't eat absurd amounts of fructose, but I'm just giving a small example just so you know that it does make a certain amount of difference that if you ingest fructose at a time when your liver glycogen is full, say maybe you have to eat a meal or two or somewhere down within the day, then the balance, whatever is left, is going to be converted into fat. Whereas if you eat fructose at a time when your liver glycogen is probable to be not full, for example, after a long fast or maybe just after getting up from sleep, you know, for breakfast, then chances are that whatever fructose is there in that particular meal or whatever you're eating uh, will go into liver glycogen and has less probability, again, it's about probability, but it has less chance of going into fat stores. So that itself shows an example of how uh, eating a you know meal timing can make a difference. It may not be extremely insignificant. Uh, it's not going to like if you're going to eat a, a fruit during more uh, you know at some other time you're going to get fat. As you know, some people would like to call it, or many uh, orthorexic bodybuilders would like to believe. But uh, it does make a certain amount of difference. And this is again talking about from a physiological fact, um, a point of view of physiological fact. Uh, this is not even accounting for you know, how a particular food may make you feel, how it affects your performance, how it affects your mood, how it affects your appetite, which all tie into various aspects of performance and the various aspects of the way you go about your day, which can indirectly, of course, affect your pro- progression and uh, end outcome as uh, in your physique. So I think definitely meal, com- meal timing and composition does matter a bit, but I'd say it's more to do with... Uh, Practical aspects and uh, individual uh, differences, more so than as as far as as far as what the evidence suggests till now, that more so than physiological general statements that we can make across people. Excellent. So if you if you were to summarize, then uh, uh, in conclusion for this argument, if comparing if it fits your macros versus the the clean eating uh, group. Um, what sort of advice would you give or, or how would you um, sort of conclude that argument uh, sort of in favor of one versus the other or is there some middle ground or if people are looking at like what, what are the most important elements of each? Um, like okay. for me like in my videos, I, I would argue and I think you would agree that if you have a physique goal, a body composition goal, tracking your calories and your, your macronutrients it is important. Like knowing... Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the people that say uh, it doesn't matter what calories you get as long as it's from clean sources, that's pretty, it's pretty easy to prove that wrong. If, I mean, it, you can't eat as much as you want uh, as long as it's clean and somehow calories don't matter. They matter. That's, uh, so, that's absolutely false, yes. Yeah, so, so, uh, so, uh, so obviously... Uh, the flexible dieters got that right. You, you just like you track any training goals, 
uh, in your progress, you track your food. Um, but so, wh where where is this middle ground, or uh, what what can people take away from this when they're looking at when they're, you know, comparing if it fits your macros versus clean eating, uh, or is there a, is there a middle ground there? Okay, so let me start with certain pointers that I would like <laughs> to give to both sides or both groups. First of all, clean eating the clean eating guys. If your critique about IFYM or flexible dieting is that it allows you to eat any bogus crap, it's not that way. So get your facts right first. Uh, will you will you eat? Will you start? Will something happen to your body, or will your hormones go out of whack, or will something massively happen to your body composition if you in incorporate a certain uh, cheat food within the the limits of your macros while making sure that you're getting your requirements there? No, there are people out there who eat uh, McDonald's every single day, meal in meal out, and they're fine. And it's not like you're going to have uh, one meal like that and you're going to you're going to drop dead. So a lot of people tend to exaggerate many things in that that side. So I don't exaggerate things. Be open to the fact that a lot of evidence may break certain pre mis you know pre-held uh, beliefs of yours. Be open to that and be make sure to utilize it. On the other hand, guys who are following IFIM, do not uh, jump on the bandwagon to the point that you say that it doesn't matter at all because there are many factors that may be beyond the realm of immediate effect on body composition that could be that should be taken into consideration. Uh, I would say that if you do, I think it's great to incorporate whatever you're doing. And uh, I would I incorporate it as well, but the thing is that you need to take into account. Maybe we need a little bit more research into the physiological effect of it, and maybe especially in 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 uh, around times when you want to when you're focusing on performance. Say a pre-workout meal, you probably don't want to have pop tarts over there because it may probably not make you feel too good. Maybe a post-workout meal when the insulin sensitivity is a little better. Maybe when the when you're done with your workout and your performance is not that much of an issue, maybe then you can incorporate a meal over there. So I think there's a certain middle ground that needs to be found. I also think that a lot of research needs to be done on specific impact of uh, of food on various hormones. I would really like to go into study with endocrinology, and I will be doing it as soon as I get some time. And when I do, I'll probably have a better idea and better understanding of uh, the impact of individual, the impact of uh, foods on individual hormones. But until then, this is my advice to both groups. Excellent advice. If people want to find out more about you or uh, or learn a little bit more about your uh, other content you have to offer, where can they connect with you online? Sure. They, uh, for anybody who wants to connect with my work, just go onto my website www.sebastianfitnesssolutions.com, and that's my blog. And I post a lot of articles over there, so you can check me out there. And I have my YouTube channel, so you can just search the same name, Sebastian Fitness Solutions, or go ahead and find the username Sebastian Fitness S L N S. And you'll find me there as well. And finally, on Facebook, the same thing: facebookcom solutions. So just go ahead and just type in a, just search a, search those terms for me, and you'll all you'll find everything, all my content right over there on the web. Excellent. Uh, I'll post all of the links down below as well in the description section here. Definitely go check this guy out. Uh, Sunit has a wealth of information and content on all those sites. Um, your blog site is excellent, by the way. Great articles there. So. Like him on Facebook uh, and definitely subscribe to his YouTube channel. And uh, Sunit, thanks again for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Josh. Thanks. I look forward to connecting again soon. All right. Have a good night. Absolutely. Good night.